Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Paul Harris and I am president of the City Club's Board of Directors. And I have to say an opening here, if ever a turnout, not just in terms of size, but in terms of who's in the room, were befitting of an esteemed presenter like we have today, this is the perfect illustration and manifestation of that. So thank you all for, for turning out. I am very pleased and honored to introduce today's speaker, former Congressman Lewis Stokes. Mr. Stokes appears today in a unique format with two of his children, journalists Lori Stokes and Chuck Stokes, and I'll give them a proper introduction in a bit. I will only very briefly discuss the history and accomplishments of a man who was so well known and admired in Cleveland and beyond. He attended Cleveland Public Schools and graduated from Central High School. He then served for three years in the United States Army and after serving his country, returned to Cleveland to attend Western Reserve University, now known as Case Western Reserve University. And he did so at night while working during the day for the U.S. Department of the Treasury. After college, he earned a law degree from Cleveland State University's Cleveland Marshall School of Law. Mr. Stokes practiced for 14 years in a firm that he co-founded and during that time period participated in three cases before the United States Supreme Court, including the landmark Terry versus Ohio stop and frisk case. On November 6, 1968, he was elected to the United States House of Representatives where he served for 15 consecutive terms and during the administrations of Presidents Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, George Herbert Walker, Bush, and Clinton. He served on numerous important committees during his tenure in, co in Congress, was a founding member of the Congressional Black Congress or Congress or Caucus and served on the House Select Committee to investigate covert arms transactions with Iran. And as I recall, had some interesting exchanges with Oliver North during that. Uh. <laughs> After retiring from Congress, Mr. Stokes joined the law firm Squire Sanders and the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences at Case Western Reserve University, where he continues to serve as a distinguishing as a distinguished visiting professor. His awards and recognition are too numerous to note, but I will say that his name appears on a whole lot of buildings here in Cleveland. <laughs> and he's received 26 honorary doctorate degrees from colleges and universities. In 2003, he was honored by Congress with the Congressional Distinguished Service Award, and just this morning, he received the Cleveland Clinic's Lifetime of Service Award. So congratulations on yet the latest. <laughs> But it does get better. Mr. Stokes and his wife of 60 years, Jay, have four children and seven grandchildren. As I noted, two of their children are with us today for what is truly going to be a family affair. Lori Stokes is an anchor of New York's WABC TV Eyewitness News this morning and Eyewitness News at noon. She came to WABC in 2000 from MSNBC NBC, where she reported for Nightly News Weekend and anchored for the NBC Sunrise and Weekend Today shows. She's an alumna of Howard University and the Ohio State, the Flying High, Ohio State University. <laughs> Chuck Stokes joined WXYZ TV in Detroit in 1981 and was named the Editorial and Public Affairs Director for the station in October 1987. He also serves as moderator and producer of Spotlight on the News, Michigan's longest running weekly news and public affairs show. His prior work includes a stint as a sports writer for the Washington Post. He earned his undergraduate degree from Morehouse College in Atlanta and a master's degree from Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. So with that, I present on behalf of the City Club of Cleveland, former Congressman Lewis Stokes, accompanied by his children, Lori and Chuck. Oh, thank you so much, uh, so nice of you. That was great, thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, isn't that nice? Oh, God. I want to thank uh, Paul Harris for very kind words of introduction. I want to say it's indeed a, a pleasure and an honor to address the City Club 
once again. As I look into this audience today, I'm pleased to see so many people who have been a part of my life and my career. First, I want to acknowledge, uh, as Paul has already acknowledged, but uh, when you spend 454 wonderful years with one woman, you just have to love everything about her. That's my wife, Jay Stokes. <laughs> In addition to uh, to Shelley, and uh, rather to uh, Lori and Chucky, who are on the stage, present uh, is also my daughter Shelley, and uh, along with her, her two sons, my grandchildren, Eric and Brett. Brett happens to be uh, an assistant county prosecutor here, and uh, Eric is uh, is government relations with the National Science Foundation, and. Uh, Pleased to have them, and my my wife's sister Arlene Dixon is here, and uh, my brother Carl's son, my my nephew Cordell Stokes, and along with them, I've got a host of uh, of relatives who come in here, uh, some from Phil Buffalo and other places, and uh, that part of the family, by the way, is related uh, as we are to Rick James, and uh, <laughs> and. Uh, so we're, I'm pleased to have all of you with me here today. Uh, in the audience here today are three former congressional staff people, Jewel Gilbert, Jackie Jenkins, Marilyn Weiner, and I'm happy to have them because they played such a great role in giving you the best congressional service of any congressional office anywhere in America. And then I, there's so many people here today that if I start naming people, <laughs> I'm going to be in big trouble. And I think I'm a little better politician than that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm just pleased to have so many wonderful friends who are here today to join me. And I thank you for being in attendance. When Patty Quinonez, Quinonez, approached me about speaking here today, we discussed having my son Chuck and my daughter Lori appear here with me. I thought it would be novel and nice. I know that it's novel, but I won't know until it's over whether it's <laughs> nice. <laughs> Both of them have been waiting a long time for this chance to ask me some questions. <laughs> I'm proud to have them on this podium. Uh, both are Emmy Award winners and Associated Press uh, Special Award winners, uh, and I'm so proud of, of both of them. Uh, I recall today that my first speech at the City Club was September 1966. I was a young lawyer. I was chairman of the legal, Cleveland Legal Branch NAACP committee. Our city had just experienced the Huff riots. My brother Carl, then a state legislator, had come by my home and together we had gone to Huff and we walked the streets, fires burning, the sound of bullets all around us. And following the riots, another lawyer, Stanley Tolliver, and I conducted three nights of hearings at Liberty Hill Baptist Church for the people in Huff to have a public hearing to describe the depressing and oppressive conditions which they lived under, and it was not pretty. The City Club invited me to a forum to speak about a grand jury report chaired by Louis Seltzer, editor of the Old Cleveland Press. The grand jury report had blamed the Huff riots on communist infiltrators who had exploited the despair in the neighborhood and had instigated and organized the violence. I spoke that day about poverty, police brutality, lack of jobs, lack of housing, lack of access to health care, all of the elements that fed the anger that exploded in Huff that night. It was reprehensible to ignore the pain in Huff 
to make it look as though it took white communists to tell poor black people how badly they were living. At about this time, our Legal Redress Committee began working with Robert Carter, who had succeeded Thurgood Marshall as head of the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund. The 1954 Brown versus Board of Education unanimous decision in the Supreme Court had held that the segregation of children by race was illegal and unconstitutional and was detrimental to both the black and the white child. The decision in Brown involved only southern states and southern schools, but the law was applicable to schools everywhere. The National NAACP saw the segregation of children in Cleveland as being unconstitutional and illegal and decided to file the first school desegregation case in the nation in the North filed in Cleveland. We filed a lawsuit, Craggett versus Rhodes, which was tried in a federal court here in Cleveland and was presided over by a judge by the last name of Calbflesh. And after conducting the case, uh, as though we were in a deep southern uh, courtroom, the judge threw the case out. The National NAACP uh, declared they had never experienced anything like that in a northern city, and they left Cleveland. Cleveland at that time was a hotbed, civil rights activity, and fighting police brutality cases, including several notable cases here in Cleveland of unarmed black men being killed by white police. Our community was also upset with a county prosecutor named John T. Corrigan, who refused to present or indict these officers for their conduct. So it was during this time we began hearing about a dynamic young black preacher named Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was then leading the famous Montgomery bus boycott. The story had gone all over the world about Rosa Parks, a 42-year-old black seamstress in Montgomery who had been arrested because she had refused to give up her bus seat to a white man. The eyes of the world were upon this eloquent, charismatic, 26-year-old Baptist minister named Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., who was challenging all of America to make real the promise of America as a land of freedom, equality, opportunity, and brotherhood. His message was different. In leading the Montgomery bus boycott, he was telling those in the movement that our actions must be guided by the deepest principles of our Christian faith. Love must be our regulating ideal. Overnight, black and white Americans of goodwill were inspired by his words, and blacks all over the country wanted to see him, wanted to touch him. Every city wanted him to visit. Cleveland was no different. When he made his first appearance in Cleveland, it was at Olivet Institutional Baptist Church, pastored by Dr. O.D. Hoover, Carol Hoover's father. All of Cleveland wanted to see him. The church was packed, and hundreds surrounded the church that night. Now, I was inside the church that night because I knew Carol. <laughs> but it was hard to get in. <laughs> it was a moving night. He inspired us in a way only Dr. King could through his oratory. As Clevelanders that night, not only were we inspired to understand the meaning of Montgomery, but also how our struggle in Cleveland was inextricably woven into the texture of the struggle of black people everywhere. In 1965 and in 1967, he came to Cleveland pursuant to a Carnegie Foundation grant to make Cleveland a pilot project 
in the registration of black voters. Indeed, he did. He registered black voters in Cleveland in record numbers. His registration drives in 1965 and 1967 were a great boon to my brother Carl's campaigns for mayor of Cleveland. In 1965, Carl lost his first bid for mayor, losing by only 1,700 votes, which made us know that we could win in 1967. When Carl won election as mayor of Cleveland in 1967, becoming the first black mayor of a major American city, Dr. King was in Carl's campaign headquarters that night. Accompanying him was Dr. Ralph Abernathy, his friend, another great preacher, civil rights leader. We did not learn that Carl had won until about 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning. When word came, people were dancing in the streets, waiting for Carl to come out and greet them. When the decision was made to go out, I was asked to remain in the building with Dr. King, who had decided to stay in the building so as not to take any of the glitter off of Carl's victory. As Dr. King and I sat there that night, he was elated. He saw this as a breakthrough for black political achievement across America, and indeed it was. Politicians across America came to Cleveland to find out how we had done it. Carl had Arnold Pinckney meet and work with them to help them. Shortly thereafter, Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and Newark all had black mayors. But that night, Dr. King said to me, we must now develop economic parity. He said, and I quote him, no ethnic group in America has ever gained equality in America without first achieving economic equality. Dr. King was right, but economic development and economic parity have been elusive goals for black Americans. When I entered Congress, the first bill I co-sponsored was the Martin Luther King Jr. Holiday Bill. Little did I realize that it would take us 17 years until January the 20th 1986 to pass and sign into law this legislation enabling the first black American to have a holiday named in his honor. I want to break my time up because I want to get up here and have a chance for Lori and Chuck to ask me some questions. So I'm going to join them at this time at the podium. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you need to be mic too, Daddy, don't you? Where's the uh, gentleman you. to mic you? I mic'd. Oh, you were mic'd? Uh, mic'd. Oh, that was a, okay. Okay. Are you sure you wanted to cut that short? <laughs> 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 no, not really. <laughs> I thought as a wise politician, he was full of <laughs> <laughs> Now he's yielding to the gentle lady and the gentleman <laughs> from Ohio. My brother, um, I asked Chuck, have you ever interviewed Daddy? And he said, mm, I don't think I've, I don't think I've ever interviewed him, but he's interviewed me <laughs> if, <laughs> and it wasn't so good i think it was more interrogation <laughs> that, was, that was probably the very good term for it right. probably when i was doing something i wasn't supposed to be doing and by the time he got finished playing defense attorney right. out of me, i knew i was in trouble <laughs> well yeah. the last time that i interviewed you was on the 50th anniversary of the march on washington and you spoke about, at that time, feeling a relationship with Dr. King because he had four children, you had four children, you had taken your four children along with mommy to D.C. for that momentous event. And you look at the promises that were made by Dr. King and all that other civil rights leaders tried to follow up with. 
while you acknowledge we've come a long way, we still have yet a long, long way to go. That, that's very true, Laurie. Uh, and it was, it was very special to me uh, two years ago when uh, WABC sent you to Washington to cover uh, the 50th anniversary that uh, when I took you to Washington in 1963, and Jay and I took you and our other three, you were about five years old. No, I was one. one. <laughs> 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 See, I told you I wasn't. Yeah. I liked it. <laughs> Maybe you just looked fine. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, when you think about it, Dr. King uh, meant so much to me at that time as, as a young lawyer. Uh, trying to do the kinds of things I was trying to do here in in Cleveland and To be there that day and see and hear him and, and Probably one of the greatest speeches ever made in time and will always remain and be uh, that kind of a speech and uh, as I've told people uh, he was he inspired me there are only two three other men who've inspired me the way he did. And one was President Sadat of Egypt and uh, Mandela, uh, President of South Africa, and, and Thurgood Marshall. Uh, when you sat with those, those three men, four men, uh, you realized they were different. And you felt you were in the presence of greatness. And uh, it's the kind of experience I'll never Never forget. Dad, let me ask you, um, about a year or so ago, I was in Alabama working on a documentary, and I had the opportunity and the pleasure to sit down with attorney Fred Gray, who was Rosa Parks' attorney right. and the legal architect for so much of the civil rights legislation. And he said to me, he said, I'm very concerned about the erosion of all the gains that we made legally during the 60s and the 70s. And he said, if we aren't careful, he said, we will lose all of that. From your legal background, first of all, do you agree with Fred Gray? And if you agree with him, why do you think we're seeing so much erosion of the civil rights progress that we made legally? That's a great question, uh, Chuck. Uh, Fred Gray uh, is a great lawyer. He was one of Dr. King's lawyer as was the young lady here, whose father, John Bustamante, was one of Dr. King's lawyers here in Cleveland. And uh, uh, Fred uh, was the head of, of teams of lawyers in the South during the movement uh, that uh, broke down so many barriers legally. And he's a graduate, by the way, of, of Case Western Reserves uh, law school and has served on their board out there for many years. Uh, and, and I respect what he says and I, I, I agree with him. Uh, it's difficult to put your finger on it because uh, we have to acknowledge we've made a lot of gains. Uh, you know, there's been progress over the years. Uh, any nation that has elected an African American as president of this country that's progress. Uh, you can't deny that. And there are other significant gains. I, uh, this morning at the Cleveland Clinic event when I was given that award, uh, Ursula Byrne, Byrne spoke, the head of Xerox in America. Uh, we have the head of American Express and, uh, and other major corporations. We've made a lot of progress, but the progress has been gradual and it has been minimal. When you look in any area of progress uh, in this country, uh, you have to acknowledge the progress has been there, but if you examine it, it's minimal progress. And what, what says that we still have a long way to go. Um, 
And you would think that in a country where they've elected a black president, that that would be the end of racism. A racism is indeed today on the rise in keeping with what, uh, what Fred said. Uh, and it's unfortunate. Uh, that a country that can elect a bland, black man as its president will continue to foster the kind of racism that we see being displayed. So what do you attribute I, that to, though? Do I attribute to? It's the fact that we live in a society where racism is endemic and institutionalized, and you cannot eradicate it uh, by legislation or anything else until Americans decide that this country uh, is the kind of a country where they can live and at the same time let others live, that they can care about uh, a society in which many people live in what we call the basement of the society. Uh, these are people that don't have any hope or faith in government or society. And when you look around what's happening all over the world where people are trying to find opportunity and freedom. Uh, that's still going on in this country. And we cannot continue to oppress people. Uh, we cannot add to it uh, or exacerbate the problem by seeing what we're seeing in major cities all over America today when you see marches and protests uh, of hundreds and thousands of people about the fact that white police are killing white ma black males. You can't tolerate that in our society. Uh, it's something that we have to stop. And, uh, but it's all basically gets back to the fact that racism is institutionalized in this society. You mentioned the government. The first time I interviewed you, was when Newt Gingrich became the Speaker of the House in the Republican Revolution. And... Sad day in America. I remember... <laughs> I remember you saying to me, Lori, we have gone from legislators to message makers, that you felt that Democrats no longer were able to exercise the authority that they once had, and that this sort of genteel, um, existence between opposing parties could go behind doors, duke it out, come out, and be respectful to one another. So when you talk about the trickle down from the government and you look at the state of Congress today, what do you think? Congress is a mess today. <laughs> if you, uh, you know, I was fortunate. When I went to Congress, I was trained by some of the greatest congresspersons who've ever served in the United States Congress. Uh, Charlie Vanek, for instance, from Cleveland. Uh, Charlie took a special interest in me. I had others who took a special interest in me for one reason or another, and they used to counsel with me and mentor me. And they would explain to me that I was serving in the greatest legislative body in the world. And they, they had me understand the history of it and how you must conduct your debate on the floor with civility. And you must do it with respect, that no, no matter how deeply involved you are, or passionate you are about the matter of which you are debating at that time, you must do it with respect for your colleagues who have also been, been elected to the greatest legislative body in the world. And, um, and so I was taught, you get up and say, uh, Mr. Speaker, and then you address the, the, your opponent as my friend, Mr. Jones from Virginia, and, and address them like that. Um, those men who taught me would have rolled over their graves the night that a congressman from South Carolina, while the President of the United States was addressing a joint session of Congress, 
to say to the President of the United States, liar. I could not believe it. That type of activity and disrespect for the institution and for the members of the institution started with Newt Gingrich, and it has continued to be a part of it. When I left in 1999, a part of the reason that I left after 30 years was because I no longer wanted to get up and get dressed and go to work and be in that kind of an environment, that I thought I had the kind of talents and ability to be able to work in a better atmosphere. And so I, I, that was part of my decision. I didn't want to live and work in that kind of an environment. Yeah, let me ask you a quick question, and perhaps this can lead into the questions that we'll be getting from the audience, a very contemporary issue. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King certainly was an outspoken opponent of uh, of civil rights and, and what was happening back in the 60s. He also was a strong uh, opponent of the Vietnam War and was one of the very first people to speak out and, and caught a lot of criticism for doing so. If he were alive today, watching the war on terror, do you think this is something he would be speaking out on and what do you think he would be saying, much of this being done in the name of religion? Well, Chuck, it's, it's difficult for me to speak for Dr. King. I'm, uh, I'm just not in that pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's true. Uh, Dr. King drew a lot of criticism uh, when he came out in a very famous church in New York and a great speech he made. Uh, where he came out in opposition to our involvement in the war in Vietnam. As a young congressman, when I went in Congress and while I campaigned before going to Congress, uh, I too came out uh, opposing the war in Vietnam. Uh, didn't please my brother because he was the mayor of Cleveland and Johnson was the president and he needed money from Johnson. <laughs> and, and I'm here criticizing the President of the United States. But uh, and, and even when I, I got in Congress, there were a very small group of us. But we, we stood on the floor. We had candlelight, candlelight uh, vigil right there on the floor of Congress opposing that war. And it was a war that was wrong for our involvement in. And uh, we were following Dr. King's leadership on that, and he was right, even though he did, he got a lot of criticism. But that's what happens when you're a leader. You're going to be criticized. You're going to have to take tough stands, and people have to be educated to understand why you took it. And America had to be understood at that time. We, there's a war in which he lost fifty thousand young men in America, on a war which, in which we should have never been involved, twelve thousand miles from our shore. And I'm sure that today he would be speaking out uh, on anything where he saw uh, that in the name of religion, people are doing uh, violence and things of that sort. I don't think he'd hesitate at all to speak out. Should we open it now? I think so, we? yeah, looking at the clock. Okay, we're gonna get to the audience participation in a moment, but uh, a few uh, announcements. First of all, we are clearly enjoying a Friday Forum featuring the esteemed and highly respected Lewis Stokes and his kids and uh, family affair, as I said before. We're going to return to them momentarily. And we'd ask you to start formulating your questions now. And please try to keep them short and to the point. And please also allow the people holding the mics to navigate the room, because we got a full room here. So you may have to adjust your chair a little bit to let people through. We welcome all of you here and those joining us via 90.3 WCPN, WVIZPBS, 104.9 WCLV Idea Stream, or one of the many radio stations across the country that carry City Club programs. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University, and PNC in our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. A week from today, 
January 23rd, the City Club welcomes Joanne Davidson, Chairwoman of the 2008 Republican National Convention, for a conversation on what to expect when your city is expecting a political convention. Congressman, you may have a thought or two on that, it just occurred to me. <laughs> for more information about our upcoming and past forums, please visit us online at www.cityclub.org. Today's forum is part of our Local Hero Series sponsored by a generous grant from Dominion. We thank Dominion for its support. We would also like to recognize the Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging, our community partner for today's program, and we thank you for your support. This program is a John W. Barkley Memorial Forum made possible by an estate gift from Mr. Barkley, and we are grateful for his support. And we welcome tables hosted today by Case Western Reserve University, Cleveland State University, the Council for Economic Opportunities in Greater Cleveland, Cuyahoga Community College, the family of Lewis Stokes, Forest City, KeyBank, Northeast Ohio Medical University, the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, and Right Path Solutions. We thank you all for your support. And we also welcome students to today's programs from Facing History New Tech High School and Shaw High School. I think we've got some students here today, so why don't you stand and be recognized there? Okay. Thank you for joining us. You're part of our future, and you can ask a question. Please remember that. Now we will start our Q&A period, and we've got two of our City Club people holding our mics, Teddy Eisenberg and Spencer Kiesel. And we welcome the first question, please. Um, good afternoon. So nice to have all of you here today. Um, in his autobiography, Mayor Carl Stokes wrote, the black community pleads for police protection and what it gets is indifference or patrols by men looking for an exercise, excuse me, for an excuse to get violent themselves. I took my election as a mandate to reform the police department. This great hope became my greatest frustration, my greatest failure. So my question is, if Mayor Carl Stokes were here today, what do you think uh, Congressman Stokes, what do you think he would say and do about the murder of 12-year-old Tamir Rice who bled on the ground for four minutes without medical assistance and died the next day? As you, as you stated, in Carl's book, Promises of Power, uh, he made that statement realizing that uh, he had tried to reform the Cleveland Police Department. And what basically he tried to do was to be able to get hold of the institution in its basic state and be able to make changes. In the same way that he wrote your, the quote you've given in his book, he said to me, he said, Lou, I don't think any mayor is going to be able to get control of a police department where it has been so institutionalized by those who are members of it. And so I think he'd have to say the same thing today. But I know that was something that really, really disturbed him. Good afternoon, uh, Congresswoman, uh, Congressman Stokes. My name is Anthony Price. Um, I'm a junior at Shaw High School and a City Club Youth Forum Council member here at the City Club. You and the men that have inspired you did great work in adversity, and I just want to thank you for that. And you stated earlier that it took 17 years for Dr. Martin Luther King Junior Day to become an official holiday. What gave you the hope to keep going in the years that it didn't get that it didn't get passed and for today, for the generations to follow you, such as me, what, can, what advice could you give to the old and young um, that are in defeat to fight for the thing that is right? Great question. Great question. And let me just start by uh, congratulating you and the other young people who are here today. Uh, many of the kinds of problems that we're talking about here today should have been solved by now. We should not have had you inherit these kinds of problems. Uh, I remember 
when uh, yeah. I remember when as a young lawyer and I was fighting those cases with N N NAACP I did so with the thought uh, in mind that through this work my children would never have to face that uh, I, I've seen uh, Chuck and, and Lori and St. Shelley in their job. I've seen them go through the kinds of things I fought so they never have to go through it. And so we failed you in the sense that you inherit these, these kinds of problems. I say to you what I say to many of the young students that I teach out at MSAS, the Mandel School at Case Western Reserve University. And I've been asked the same question by those young people. Why did it take 17 years to be able to enact a piece of legislation honoring one of the greatest men who has ever lived? And basically, uh, because we had overcome uh, racist attitudes and things in the Congress. And believe me, in January of 1969 to 1986 when we passed the bill, it was work. We continued working week after week and day after day and month after month because we knew that this country needed to give that man that kind of recognition for posterity. And so we did what you have to do in a legislative body. You have to be patient. You really have to know where you're going and then be willing to spend the kind of time it takes to accomplish something that you know should be done. And uh, I tell the young students out there uh, in social work whom I, whom I, I teach, uh, that the kind of work they're doing is so important. They're, they're advocates, they're trying to take care of poor people, people on welfare, people uh, who have no voice and depend upon someone else to help them be guided through their lives. And I explain to them it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, I'd lost many a battle legislatively in Congress. I'd look up on the board sometimes and you've been in a fight and you see you lost by one vote. And that tells you how important one vote is. But we knew and we knew and understood that the process was slow but it's sure if you just keep working at it. And so as young people I say to you, um, we need you. We're going to need your leadership. Uh, young people like you are the future of this country. Uh, you'll be the ones sitting on this stage and speaking from this podium. And that's why it's so important that you get the kind of education that is going to enable you in America to continue the fight and the struggle that so many of us have been in for 50 or more years. Yeah. Congressman, over here on your far left. <laughs> oh, okay. Speaking of votes, the Voting Rights Act mandated the creation of majority minority districts. It seems to me that that has isolated the African American vote into a relatively few districts across this country. From your vantage point after 30 years in the Congress, has the creation, in, in your opinion, has the creation of majority minority districts enhanced or diminished the influence of the African American vote? It's a good question. <clears throat> when I went to Congress, it was because 
my brother Carl, who was serving in the Ohio legislature and was representing the 21st Congressional District in the Ohio State Legislature, and Carl had become so popular, so charismatic, that they, they were afraid that he might just decide to run for Congress. And so, in order to stop it in its tracks, <laughs> the same legislature in which he was serving gerrymandered the 21st District of Ohio. They took black people and moved them all over the county. John, you remember, you were involved in, in, in the struggle against all of that stuff. And, uh, so they diluted the district so that there was no base in the 21st district. And so Carl came home and came to the NAACP and he asked them to file a lawsuit for him against the legislature in which he was serving. <laughs> the NAACP, guess who they gave the case to? <laughs> they gave me the case and the Legal Redress Committee uh, brought a lawsuit against the governor and against the state legislature uh, because of the illegal uh, gerrymandering of the district. Uh, and as a consequence of it, that was the case we took to the United States Supreme Court. We won the decision. When we won, Avery, the, the uh, Supreme Court ruled that you had to draw those lines again and draw them along what they call contiguous constitutional lines. When they redrew the district, the district came out 65% black, 35% white, which meant that Carl then had the base by which he could run for Congress. Well, unfortunately, I called him up that morning. I said, hey, we just won your case. You can, you can, go, to, you can go to Congress. He said, I don't want to go to Congress. I'm the, I'm, I'm the mayor of Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I wind up then uh, uh, having to run for that seat. <laughs> but uh, in real answer to your question, uh, that's what's happened. In many places uh, that black constituencies have been gerrymandered out of power in congressional districts. Now, interestingly enough, they've done a better job over the years because when I went to Congress, uh, there were only six black Congress people there. There are now 43. There were no black congresspersons from the South. Now the Southern uh, blacks in Congress outnumber the Northern ones. Uh, what has happened, though, and I think what you might be, be sort of aiming at, too, is that uh, in some cases, Republicans have said, uh, particularly they were in control, that um, the creation of, of black districts was uh, causing uh, Democrats to lose power. And... Uh, there's been a lot of wrangling, wrangling back and forth around that measure. But when I look at the Congress today and see that by utilizing districts where you can have majority districts, that it's inured uh, to our benefit to the extent that uh, we've gone from the nine that were in Congress on the day I took office in 69 to 43 congresspersons there today. Okay. Congressman Stokes, uh, back here in the back corner. Sure. Um, I was proud in 1968 as a new resident of Cleveland to see you elected to the Congress and cheered that victory. Regrettably, I was not able to vote in that election for you because I was only a less than six month resident of Ohio. And as you might remember, the voter registration laws required you to be at least six month resident in Ohio before voting. Um, that's all changed, obviously, partly as a result of the Vo Voting Rights Act. Today I heard that you've been asked to take on another volunteer role by Governor uh, John Kasich to be the honorary chair with uh, George Voinovich of a committee to discuss the 
relationship between police and the community, basically, but I think primarily the African-American community around Ohio. And I know you don't do anything honorarily, so I'd like to know what you think your role will be in that activity and what you hope the results might be. I can understand why John Kasich asked you. I didn't quite understand why you re accepted the, re the activity <laughs> until I heard you talk about the 19, the hearings you did after the Huff riots, and then it made sense to me. <clears throat> Thank you for your question. Uh, Governor Kasich uh, called me and asked me if I would join uh, Senator, former Senator Voinovich, as um, a co-chairperson, honorary co-chairperson of that committee. And uh, uh, the governor and I served together in the Congress. And we both, uh, we've had a long respect and uh, friendship with one another. We're different parties and we have different politics. But nonetheless, in the way I served in the Congress, I had friends on both sides of the aisle, and he was a friend. Um, he shared with me his concerns about the situation that is occurring in this state as well in all other states about police community relations. And he felt very strongly that as governor of our state, he should be doing something positive about the situation and inquiring as to uh, what are these conditions? Uh, what kind of training are the police getting? Uh, what type of psychological testing is done bringing people into a police force where they face uh, quick decisions and, and long hours and uh, being tired uh, under the stress under which they serve. And uh, he wants to go to five cities and maybe more. He wanted the investigation completed by the 30th of uh, April. Uh, I said to the governor, you know me well enough to know that I won't be associated with anything unless you're really trying to do the right thing here. And he said, Louis, uh, he said, I'm serious. He said, I want this task force to report back to me with recommendations that I can then take action on. Well, in keeping with, with in fact, I work with Republicans and I've worked with Democrats. I got things done. And that's why I was willing to accept being a somebody has to do something. People are marching in the streets. People are marching in the streets. And, and, and I'm one of those people, let me say this, I go on that committee uh, understanding there are good policemen in this country. We look to them every day. Uh, I look at every night if something happens in my house, I look for the police to get there, <laughs> right, right. And, uh, and, but it's like any other field in America, that you've got some good people, and most of whom are, most of whom are good, and you've got some bad apples. We, we cannot let those few spoil it for the rest, and at the same time damage communities all over uh, our country. And so, um, with the governor's assurance that this was a positive thing, and the fact that two co-chairs, uh, one was going to be uh, one of our former legislators here, uh, a former Senator Nina Turner. She's going to be a co-chair along with uh, um, a man in the uh, governor's office by the name of Bourne, whom I don't know, but whom uh, he works for the governor, and I'm sure that means the governor is going to have something done. So uh, in the same way, you know, in the Congress, if you remember, I headed up investigations there. And uh, so, but I'm retired and I accept the honorary position, but the governor knows me well enough. Uh, no, I'm not gonna be a part of anything that's not right, but somebody's got to do the job. If he wants to do it, fine. Thanks. 
Sir, we talked about the climate of the police department here in Cleveland. Um, two landmark cases from the 60s, one that you tried, was Terry versus Ohio, which is the Supreme Court, where it came with the stop and frisk policies as far as government policies that you were able to receive, um, obtain federal change in policies and stop and frisk. But another case was called MAP versus Ohio, which was called search and seizure, was also the actions of the Cleveland Police Department as well. If you were to reflect back then in the 60s compared to now, what does is have anything changed or is there anything we need to still change? <clears throat> it's a great question. And let me tell you why I think it's, it's great. 50 years ago, I took a case in the United States Supreme Court that originated here in Cleveland involving a police officer and uh, three males, one white and two black. And they were stopped on 13th and Euclid. And uh, anyway, the seizure, they seized two guns and so forth. But anyway, I took the case up in the United States Supreme Court and uh, uh, it became a landmark case in constitutional and in criminal law. About a month ago, 50 years later, I went over here to the Court of Appeals to hear my grandson, Brett Hammond, arguing that same case in the Court of Appeals. Only difference was he won his case. <laughs> but uh, uh, <laughs> the answer to your question is uh, like map, map, map case, we map. Uh, who became famous as a result of this case. It became a landmark case also. And I had based my taking of the MAP case up uh, maybe to the United States Supreme Court on the basis of MAP, because they said under the Fourth, fourth Amendment to the Constitution uh, that there are three elements that have to be present uh, in order to be able to seize under the uh, Fourth Amendment. And I felt they weren't there and I used the map case to go up on. Unfortunately, by the time I got there, the court had, s had swayed over a little bit, and they swayed enough to, to, uh, to set up the map stops. They told police what you can and cannot do uh, as, as police. And uh, uh, yes, you have to continue. Uh, policing is an area in which the law is involved every day all over this country and where you stop people. In New York, uh, it's, it's been a terrible thing. They took the Terry case up there, the police did, and, and interpreted Terry as saying, you can just stop people on the street and, uh, and search them. And, and, okay, and they never said that. What they said was under certain circumstances, in order to protect yourself, uh, a policeman can stop and search. But they didn't do it in New York, but where they're just stopping people every day, and it's a real problem in New York. Thank you. They say all good things must come to an end. In this case, it's all great things must come to an end. But thank you very much, Congressman Stokes, for joining us. Thank you, Lori and Chuck, for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you as well. This forum is now adjourned.